My name is Earl Willis Jr. and today is July the 19th, 2018 and today we're talking to Mr. Robertson and this is a veterans interview. Mr. Robertson. Lee. Mr. Lee. You just say Lee. Lee. Okay. Yeah. Lee. That doesn't make me sound as old. Okay. <laughs> Lee, where and when were you born? I was born in Calhoun, Kentucky, June the 16th, 1922. 1922, so that makes you 96, correct? 96. 96. Uh, who, uh, did you have any siblings or any family members that are in the uh, military? I had my family, mom, dad, our sister was the oldest. Uh, she is three years and a week older than I. Okay. She's, she's gone. And my brother Sam was 15 months older than I, and uh, he died uh, about a year and a half ago. And he was in the 101st Airborne, and uh, uh, he fought all over Europe and landed on paratrooper. And he 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 was one of the few in the in the invasion of Normandy, the first flight in, he was in a glider and he he and his buddy lived and some thirteen others that were in there died in the landing crashed and he fought his way back toward the beach and uh, got wounded and they ran over a truck ran over a bomb or a landmine and he got wounded and uh, came out of it that guy is is pretty amazing. He came home, uh, brought a dog with him from Germany. Yeah. And he said when he came off the ship, you weren't supposed to be bringing an animal. And he had him kind of head back in his duffel bag with enough out, Stephen out to breathe. And, and Steve started barking like, uh, Sam started barking like a dog in case his dog barked there. Oh, were they dragging him out? And they said he, they thought he was a Section 8 man. Crazy? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you want to show him, you want to show him that picture? That picture right there when he would, and that was here in the Bone Green Warren County Courthouse uh, back in November uh, a year ago, this, this past November. And he was awarded a medal from the French government, and it was the highest honor they give to a non-French uh, military man for what he did there. And uh, and Sam, somewhere in his later years, he and his family went over there, and they found the spot where he felt like that the glider crashed, and uh, it's quite a story. Yeah, that guy so let, me, let me show them if they haven't, they can see it right here. That That's guy came home, uh, married him a little girl from across the Green River there, and uh, they had five children, and uh, he had two jobs, worked for General Electric, a regular job in Owensboro, Kentucky, and, uh, and then he had, uh, he taught electricity at the community college over there. Okay. And uh, raised five kids and worked pretty hard. Yeah, so like he had a, a good life. And, and he did. For, fought for his country and yeah. provided for his family. He was, When he was 89 years old, he retired. Uh, yeah. And he told me a couple of years later, he said, I retired too early. To retire too early, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, what uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? Getting out of high school. Getting out of high school. I got out of high school in May of '41, and Pearl Harbor was December the seventh of '41. Okay. On uh, December the seventh of '41, my buddy who who graduated with me in past May, I'd gone out to his house four or five miles from Calhoun, and he. In an old 37 Ford on on Sunday afternoon, we were riding around and uh, that's okay. That's okay. So you were just getting out of high school. Yeah, and uh, and we we heard that afternoon that Pearl Harbor was bombed. 
But let me tell you something, my friend. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was or no. what it was. No, no. I just graduated from high school, a country boy. Yeah. Back then, you didn't know much about a yeah, mile away. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then, uh, less than a year, I was on a ship in Portland, Oregon, and uh, we got out to sea, and they said we're going to New Guinea. I didn't have any idea New where Guinea was, that was or what that was. Yeah. All right. So you, uh, what did you? Do? So you said you wouldn't. When you said Pearl Harbor was bombed, you just knew it was bad, right? You didn't know where it was or what state. I was. didn't really know. I, you know, I knew something. He said Hawaii. Then I put it all together. I guess we had heard about it a little bit, but. Wasn't very familiar with Did it. Did you have any idea that it was going to lead to a, a, a world war? Did you? I guess. Uh, I guess we. I guess we did. We. we yes. hey, you can't bomb our part of the world without us retaliating somewhere. Yeah. And it wasn't long after that that you heard uh, Franklin Roosevelt make his declaration of war speech. Yeah. So, uh, in what branch did you, uh, of the military did you serve? Well, I'm tell you, so I was in the Army, and uh, we got plenty of time, I guess. Oh, we got plenty. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, on this one morning, I left my house on Main Street in Calhoun, and where 750 other people lived, big city boy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I walked down to... Will Heights Cafe, that's where everybody went. He uh, had a little dance floor by down there, but no alcohol. You can get a cherry Coca Cola. And uh, that's where the bus met us when we got on. We got on that bus, drove to Evansville, Indiana, an hour and a half away. And uh, Evansville, we got on a train. For, and it, it's the first time I'd been on a train. Oh, yeah. And uh, we went to Fort Benjamin Harrison up close to Indianapolis, and that's really where I was officially inducted and, and became a soldier. They shot me in the rear end with both hips with, yeah. for, while I was standing still, threw clothes at me, yeah. and, uh, and then we got on a, a train the next morning to heading to our destination, and we didn't, they never know where that was going except when we got on that train in Fort Benjamin Harris, they said, in two hours and a half, you'll be at your destination. Well, I knew it couldn't be very far away from where we're going, and, and Fort Campbell was just being built down there at, between uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and Hopkins, Hopkins Hook, and, yeah. and uh, we got there, unloaded, and we jumped out of that train and we on the mud streets. They were still building Fort Campbell when we got there. Okay. And that's and we we got there and uh, and and uh, that's where I did my basic training. I guess that was uh, in the fall of forty two. Okay. And and then uh, forty three uh, we got through Tennessee maneuvers and we went out to Camp Park to Texas and Abilene, Texas. And from there we went to Camp Donna Anna, New Mexico, where we did uh, uh, combat training and gunnery and all that business. And then the next spring we got on a troop train and went to Vancouver Barracks and Vancouver Washington across the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon. But what did your what did your um, your mom and dad think about all this? Well, they they were they didn't know what to think. They knew I was in the army. And they, they knew that I was there for one reason. That it was to go to war. Yeah. And, uh, and let me tell you something, my friend. It was a whole lot tougher on them than it was me. Yeah. We knew. I knew what you, I was doing. You want to show this and explain explain to everybody what this is? Well, that was that was. Uh, but you hung in the window, and the star was for family member that was in the service so my mom and dad had two sons and a and a daughter and Samuel Hagen this guy right here and me were the two sons that we were in the service and my mama was awful proud though yeah I don't blame her yeah so 
uh, was there any reason? That, so, have you ever, when you were growing up, did you think about the army or think about the military any? Or? No, no, never in my mind. Never volunteered for a thing while I was in there. Never did turn down an assignment. I just, if they said that's what we want you to, okay, okay. But I didn't volunteer. Yeah. Uh, do you? Do you crawl? Uh, do you remember any of your training? Your basic training? Do you? Uh, do you remember any of that? The training? Yeah. Oh, remember all of it like it's yesterday. Were you, pretty, were you in pretty good shape? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something. My brother, my dad became a disabled farmer when I was seven. He was eight. My sister was nine. We plowed you know, two of us together to turn the plow around at the corner. But I worked all my life. And when I was seven, eight years old, I worked. I would work till still working. Yeah. But when we were Sam and I've talked about that, when we went in the service and had that basic training, we, we had those truck crawled under those infiltration places and barbed wire and ran and climbed. Uh, some of those some of those guys that were fat and, and sissies from, <laughs> from the city, yeah. they had a hard time. We, that was a piece of cake piece for, of cake for you, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it is right yeah, I tell you, I think about that. Yep, yeah, how good it was that we were that way. Yeah, yeah. You were just, you were just country boys, and you were ready yeah, to and physically fit. Physically fit. Yeah. So you and your brother were both in good shape, right? Yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. I mean, he's a little bit smaller than this I am. Is, we were small this is, guys. This is how, how that was at Fort Campbell, and I, I was that was during basic training. And I was probably 19 years old there. Okay. And uh, I'm a baby face guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you do you uh, did you uh, did you like the training? Did you like the the? Let me tell you something. It's outside, outside of the combat time, and which is a lot, and it was some tough time. But remembering. The military, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed those 38 months I was in there. And I, I try to figure out why. Well, you got to meet people from everywhere. You traveled everywhere. You saw the countries you wouldn't have seen without it. And you take the dangerous times as you were in there. The rest of it, to me, was very enjoyable. Yeah, and you had a, you had a country boy from Kentucky going to New Guinea. Right. In Japan. Yeah. It would it would never happen. You know, the the thing, the common denominator, I have done about forty of these interviews and a lot of these guys are just like you. I've interviewed my dad, he's a country guy, a country boy. A lot of these people are just country people, small small towns, and then the military gives them a chance to go all over the world and do things they never would have done. Wouldn't have done it. Wouldn't have done it. And but but let me tell you, I'm gonna say this to you, I'm ready to get out. Were you ready to start a new life? When we, we haven't talked about that, but we occupied Japan. Uh, and we pulled in in, in a ship. And by the way, uh, a side item, we went in Tokyo Bay. And on both sides of Tokyo Bay, those 16-inch guns were not very far apart. We would have had a hard time invading Japan. It would have been a bad mess. We would have lost more Americans than were killed in those two atomic bombs. Yeah. As bad as that was. But that ended it. And that wasn't what ended the war. It, it did end the war because they were already whipped down. What really whipped Japan was that 19 pound firebomb that we dropped like. Easter eggs yeah. for six months, and then we had them whipped industrially, militarily, and we just, we were we were stronger, better equipped, better everything than than Japan had. Yeah. Can you can you tell us about your, your tank? Is that the Sherman tank? Is that what that, that was? That was Sherman tank. M four A one. Yeah, Sherman. Medium tank and a it had a five man crew. It had a. Uh, Tank commander up in the turret, a gunner up in the turret, a radio operator and a loader up in the 
tour. Uh -huh. Down in in the nuts section was me, the driver, and Cooper, the assistant driver, and he had a bow gunner, a 30 caliber machine gun. Yeah. And you just didn't sight, you just swiveled. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it had ins inside in there also in the tank that you could put up a 50 caliber machine gun. It was That's an bad. An aircraft. Oh yeah, 50 caliber is bad. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So uh, you don't really think about now. I don't think about in the Pacific uh, War or the theater. I don't think about a lot of tanks. I used to think about them in like in Europe, but but. But but you talking to you, uh, it's usually like I think about Pacific it's like jungles and stuff. But I guess there was some some tape was there tape battles. Well, there's some, there was you know, let me tell you something. I'm pleased that I was in the Southwest Pacific as a tanker, because the Japanese didn't have a gun that would blow a tank up. The, Ger the Germans had some. Bad they had a they had one that. An armored piercing okay. that would come through the side of it, our thin spot. But then you were about 88 millimeter would blow a tank up. We didn't have to face that, but uh, jungle warfare, was the, the biggest thing we had to do is, is have a tank buddy and, and be sure that there wasn't any Japanese getting on your buddy's tank because they dropped that Molotov cocktail down there. They, it was they could hide easier, yeah. But but it wasn't as dangerous as it was if you'd been in Europe at the time. What were the Japanese tanks like? Uh, outdated. Outdated. And weren't up to snuff. Okay. So the the Sherman tank was superior to the Japanese. Oh tank. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now let me tell you something. I'm okay. going to tell you this about the about the the individual people. They they weren't big people but they were physically fit and strong and then New Guinea they had the Imperial Marines. Okay. And they were the biggest people, Japanese people. And 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 when we went to Japan to occupy it, we had an interpreter. And the interpreter we had was a guy that had been in the Imperial Marines and he'd been in New Guinea. Okay. We the enemy of mine. Yeah. And we talked. And I said, you don't look as me as you did in this one star helmet in the bushes. He said, you don't need <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but you go to thinking about it, that was a fine looking man sitting here talking to this guy. If we could have just sat down together early and talked about that, we wouldn't. Have, we could have talked us out of the war. Yeah, war is crazy. Yeah, and war is hell. Yeah, yeah. I, I, everybody that's, that's been in and talked to me, it, it's, it's not good. No. Uh, do you do you remember now? You said you were laying, laying on the beaches. Can you explain to people how you would lay on the beaches? on uh, the beachhead. Can you explain that to people? We had little landing crafts. Okay. That the front of would come down, you'd drive out and hit the beach. Okay. And, and I, let me tell you something, we we weren't ever as bad as it were in Iwo Jima and some of those other places where they were just thick. We never did have Except when we landed in Lengayan Gulf in the Philippine Island, is the only time where we faced getting off tough. Yeah. The rest of them, we, we piece of cake, but we set up and we didn't try to invade New Guinea. You couldn't have anyway. It's, it's so jungle, but we established uh, a few hundred yards of beach where we could have a bear strip and a hospital and yeah. food coming, supplies coming in. But the Japanese back then, well, when we were down there, they'd been cut off by the, by the U.S. military and they were getting in bad shape. But didn't have food, didn't have supplies. If you don't mind me asking, what was it like to be in a tank battle? What was
was it like? Yeah, what was it like? Now, we didn't have any tank battles. Okay. We had tanks and and here's the way they operated over there. The jet, the infantry and the armor worked together. If the infantry got pinned down, why well, they'd call for the tanks. And we'd go up and we'd blow up whatever was in the way and then when we got where they were infiltrating our tanks, we'd call for the entry and they'd come up and, and clean that up. So you helped, you helped each other out, didn't you? Yeah, it was a team effort all the way. And i tell you, what, for both infantry and armor, we wouldn't have been very very successful without the other. So you, did you ever have any air support? Oh, yeah, when we'd first make it, we'd have that a day or two day before, before we went in. And, would the, would the navy ships? Would it? Would they? Would they kind of lay far down the beach and kind of the navy ships? Yes. Yeah. You know, we didn't have as much of that. We did in the Philippines, but most of it was done by airplanes. Okay. Dropping bombs and moving, okay. moving the Japanese back away from the beach so okay. we could land. Did you ever? What was your opinion of? Uh, Douglas MacArthur, did you did you know of him? Or? Yeah, I saw him many saw him? times. Many times. Yeah, and uh, and we, uh, I guess you uh, you you make these remarks, but you doubt deep you have to appreciate the guy and where he is and where he's been, and how he got there, and everything. That's, but we called him Dugout Doug. Dugout Doug. Yeah, but he when he. Did the walking to the beaches all? Oh, it was pretty clear when he he looked like he's in the first wave, but he wasn't. He they'd been kind of he was kind of safe when he. The kind of, was it kind of staged a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because they show him walking on the beach with his with his the water down the water up to his knees. Yeah. And we had already got the beaches clear safe. Yeah. 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 So you did you so did you think he was a good soldier, a good leader? Yeah, I'd yeah. say he was. Yeah. Yeah. So you said you you saw him from like far off or oh, close? I knew I, there's a time or two when he I never spoke to him, but he was close enough that I could have hollered, but I didn't, of course. Yeah. Uh did you what did you do uh, between times of, of fight and uh, what would you how did you occupy yourself? Well <clears throat> And you know what? We we've still got a record for that. We were 66 straight days in combat, night and day. And night was the snipers, and it wasn't. You weren't out there battling and ducking for 66 days, but you were in the combat for that long, night and day, and uh, that that got. To you. That got on your nerves. And yeah. Uh, hey, listen, this old, where is that picture of my whole crew right there? There it is. I don't guess you can see that. That's too small, isn't it? No, we can. The guy on the far left standing there was Al Joe, I mean, Kenneth Boucher. Okay. And he was the one that was. Killed by a black tree blast artillery, and he's in a tour to the tank with the with the top open, and a shrapnel hit him mm -hmm. in the jugular vein, and he bled, bled out. And he did die instantly. And he was in that tour with the old Aljo Norberger, and Cooper and Ryer and I were under the tank, and that we had this tank battle. He's Japanese, if we hadn't have fired on them, we wouldn't have lost him. But we, they were coming down the highway and we were back in the brush. Yeah, yeah. And not 40 feet off the highway. And uh, it was dark and uh, you couldn't see the, through the sights, but the tank next to ours, the guy got on the back with a, with a little stick he had with a flag on it and and when that gun when that tank going down that road got in line with that gun he'd punch him in the back and he'd fire 
Well, we blew 13 vehicles up on that road, and 135 Japanese were killed. We lost one man. We had two wounded that were in the kitchen truck for our food, and they they got hit by a hand grenade. Okay. But we had those when they were going down there. There were some of them just tanks. Some of them were were weapons carriers, and some of them were troop carriers that had guns in there. And so there was a lot of Japanese that weren't killed that were crawling around that area and closest to me to that door didn't see me because we behind them was the truck those tanks burning and we were in the still in the dark and they lit up in there but that was the toughest night battle I ever had and that next morning we pulled our tank around without our radio operator we had taken him out of the tank and covered him on the ground and we backed out and went around and there was one vehicle over there on the road that hadn't been hit and we blew that one away. Yeah. And then we got in a in our kitchen truck yeah. and drove across a rice paddy to a place that we knew about or I didn't but somebody did and took the our, the body of Kenneth Boucher to a place to be buried. Yeah. So he was he was buried. In, uh, yeah, in the and let me tell you something. One of the things that I wish that I had that I had done, I promised myself that I was going to go to Akron and find his mom and dad after the war and talk to them, but I never did do that. Yeah. But uh, but he said when we went under the Golden Gate Bridge leaving, he said I'll never get back. I never felt that way, and most people, most soldiers didn't think he's going to be them. Yeah, yeah. That had been disastrous. Even when we were in the toughest battles, it never entered my mind. This may be it. Never did. So you know, you're gonna make it. Yeah. So it didn't, even, it didn't cross your mind, did it? No. No. Yeah, and that may have something to do with the reason I'm still here. You, 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 you didn't have any doubt in your mind that you were going. I'm not gonna make it. Did you did you oh you're here aren't you? <laughs> did you did you take ever take any uh, like direct hits or? Yeah, was, I did. Took a direct hit in the front of it and, and with one of those arm piercing and fell off. Okay. Little sparkles inside, but did you now the 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 Sherman tank it didn't have it have like in the bottom where you can get out right? Escape pad. Escape pad. Did you ever use that? No. Okay. But that's what it had. It could have. Did any of the, did, I know sometimes, did any of the Japanese soldiers uh, use themselves as like, uh, did you see any kamikaze attacks where they had like grenades and they laid down and trying to blow themselves up or? No, I, I didn't, but let me tell you something, in New Guinea, when they would attack sometimes, Half of them didn't have a gun. Really? They had bamboo poles and spears, and they just weren't equipped. They didn't have guns sometimes? Some of them didn't. Oh, and they still attacked. Yeah. <laughs> suicide. Yeah, I, I've read that, that the Japanese more or less thought they, that I guess they, they had the, the samurai spirit, and then they would just didn't really need anything. They just they're they were just going to win. Now, let me tell you something else about that. You know, they, they had the kamikazes. Kamikazes. Some of them were shackled in that airplane. If they came back, they'd kill them. So they wasn't doing it because they. Well, they weren't doing it all. I'm doing it voluntary because we had one that landed on our airstrip. And you think what it took, but it didn't take any bravery of him because that. He wasn't going to get alive if he went back anyway, so he took a chance and landed, and we, he was he was shackled. So he was, yeah. He so he wasn't just doing it out of I'm sure he did it because he 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 had because he had to. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like sometimes they they overemphasize how brave they were, and they they just did that. 
Now, I saw when we had that big convoy of ships going to invade the Philippine Islands at Langay and Gulf, and we had two planes, that, Japanese planes that crashed in, and where they were close enough on to us that we could see where they were. They crashed into the into a ship, and they, and they killed some soldiers, and they buried them at sea. I don't remember, but can you tell? Can you tell people how people are buried at sea? Can you explain that how they how that's done? Well, I guess everybody has seen that picture, and they they had it there. They have a kind of a steel little cage that the body's in that, that they buckle them in. It's open at the top, and they had a place where they could and the ship where they could just put that in there, and it slides off into the water. Do they put? Do they? Uh put an American flag, usually? Uh, didn't have them. I, I don't know that, uh, maybe they're supposed to, but the things, and I never saw it close enough to see it. I knew they did it, but I think there was just American flag over the top of that, that stayed on the, Okay. they slipped under it. Okay, yeah. That's, that's kind of uh, makes people think about how their family members, they never got to see their family members. There's nowhere to visit them at because they're buried at sea. That's, right. that's kind of hard to think about. Tough, tough closure there. Yeah, it is tough closure. Uh, if, if there was anything that got you out of, uh, of trouble and, and was anything that you, you kept on thinking about or you learned that kept you, you think, kept you safe or was it something that you, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense, but it's not. You just, you just nothing I did. I just, I just think it wasn't, wasn't my turn. Wasn't your turn. But let me tell you something. You know that you've heard of the, the philosophy of a fatalist. The, we had an old Red Labor from Wake Forest, North Carolina. He was a tank driver, and and, and there's a picture of him somewhere. But he was a character. He was a high cheekbone, red-headed, wild man, and when I first met him, is we, we was trying to get him out of Clarksville, Tennessee, because he's drunk and wanting to fight everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but he was a brave guy, and, and he also got me to hide when he was out shooting at night in that tank battle, but I, I was going to say something about him, and I forgot what my, lost my train of thought. What were we were talking about? We were talking about how, how there was anything that you contributed to you making it home safe. Was there something that you kept on thinking about or you there was some kind of plan you had or you just went with your intuition or what, what do you... I guess I don't think I had any kind of a plan at all. I think what you do and, and I, got, I thought about that a whole lot, the question you asked and, and how unprepared I'd have been if I'd have gone straight from home to New Guinea without basic training and all that. Now, I guess you get hardened to the fact, uh, you know, if, uh, now if we found between here and the front door 40 people laying there dead, it, we'd be shocked. We got to the point where you'd step over them and do what you had to do. Yeah, yeah, I've talked to some people that were in combat and and they could they could smell the people that were dead, and they were just eating their eating their lunch or their supper or whatever, and they were just yeah. just a part of life. It's part of life. Yeah, it's a, a lot of times. I, that's that's the reason why I uh, I interview uh, people like yourself is uh, uh, the things you see that you get used to that people shouldn't get used to. But people, people shouldn't get, have to get used to stepping over bodies all the no. time. No. So yeah, that was That's what I was talking about a while ago on War as Hell. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. You shouldn't come, you shouldn't get used to being numb to did that. Did we show that picture? I think you did. We can show it again. Okay. Here's something I was proud of on a, the old Ford 4 Tank Battalion basketball, basketball team. That's, team. That's me down front in the middle. What year is this? That was in uh, 40. Three. Forty-three. 
Camp Barkley, Texas. Okay. And let me tell you, we put Hardin Simmons Universities in Abilene, Texas. There's another college. Is there an Abilene Christian? Maybe there is. There is an Abilene in Texas. I believe there is. Abilene Christian was in Abilene, Texas. Yeah. And we played both of those colleges, and we whooped them. Did you? And you know why? They didn't. Uh, the the people that were still there on that team were people that didn't qualify for service. So we didn't have. We didn't have their. We didn't fight against their best players. Yeah. But that was fun. Was there was there any time, uh, if you don't mind me asking, were you like when you were fighting? Did you did you pray or did you, did you think about home or what, 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 what did you? I guess you prayed. I wish I could say that I was a more avid prayer than than I was, but I certainly believed in prayer. And I certainly believe in it now, and I certainly believe in a heavenly eternity. But I don't know that I spent much time. I, I guess you just acted and reacted. Yeah. Did what you have to do. Did we show that picture of me yeah, there down know. front? Now where's this at? That's, that, that's basic training for Fort Campbell. Campbell. Okay. So you're a screaming eagle, right? Are you a screaming eagle? No. What's that? You said that was Fort Campbell. Oh, that's the, uh, we did, we were the 44th tank battalion. Oh, okay. Okay, but you were the the Fort Campbell is a screaming eagle, though, so, right? Well, that's the 101st Airborne. Yeah, yeah. 101st. But we the, at that time the 12th Army, it was just armor. Okay. Okay. The, the air the uh, air force or. Now this is you said this was this is your you and your brother and your dad. My brother, my dad, and I in Calhoun, Kentucky. Calhoun, Kentucky. I guess we were home on a furlough. Yeah, it looks like there's no leaves in the tree. Maybe November. Yeah. So my brother went. He did some training in Lexington and in, in uh, electricity and linemen and that type thing. And he went over. Uh, he went in a little earlier than I did, but. He did some training before he went overseas, so, but, was it he, was he in you? No, he's not in, even, he's not in uniform there, is he? No, you are. That's, yes, that's my brother Sam, and okay. he hadn't, he hadn't been in, he hadn't been inducted yet, okay. even though he was doing some military training in Lexington. Okay, yeah, you are, but he isn't. Right. Now, how did you, how did you feel about when the, when the end of the war, when you were released, how what did you feel about when you got out of the military? Let me tell you something. When I got on that ship in Tokyo the first day of December, we got to San Diego the 15th. We there a couple of days, and we left there the 23rd of December on a train to Fort Knox, and. On the 24th of December is where I was officially discharged. When before I was signed a discharge, they said, "Would you like to sign up for the reserves?" I said, "I appreciate the offer, but I had I've had enough." Had enough. I did. I didn't do that. But that's the interesting thing. You talk about a a great Christmas. 24th. We went to the bus station to ride to Owensboro, Kentucky. That's as close as they could get to Calhoun, my hometown, 18 miles away. When we got to the bus station, it was icing on the roads. Okay. So they took us to the depot, and we we're gonna ride a train, which we did. And on the train, there was a girl came to me and she said, aren't you Lee Robertson? I, yeah, she said, and she told me her name. I've gotten it right now. Calloway, like Virginia Calloway. And she'd been working in Louisville and she is going home for Christmas. Well, when we got to Owensboro, her mom and dad were there in the car to take her to their home in Calhoun. And that's where I got a ride, from Owensboro to Calhoun. 
when I got to Calhoun, it was the 25th day of December 1945, and ice was everywhere. And it was 5 a.m. when I knocked on my front door, and they all came. And they didn't really know. They knew I was getting ready to get out, but they didn't know I was there. I, yeah. And uh, they came to the door, and we had one heck of a celebration. That's a good Christmas present, wasn't it? And my brother had been home two weeks. Okay. And my sis was there, and you can you can imagine that we got up at five o'clock, all went in there and trying to look each other over and kind of readjusting and all. And Mama made chocolate and cookies and cake, and we never did go back to bed yeah. that morning. But but you can at least say the least that that was one heck of a Christmas of five of us. Mom, Dad, and their three children were together. Yeah, and you both, both uh, uh, your sons that were in combat were, were were safe and home. That's right. Can you imagine how much fun that made my mama? Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can imagine how special that was. Yeah. Uh, do you? Is there? How did you adjust getting out of the army? Did you, how'd you adjust? Well, listen, you know, they said that you had uh, adju adjusting time, and I couldn't imagine what that was. But my mom said that we were strange a little bit, the way we operated, Sam and I. And for instance, instead of, we'd see somebody going down the street, and we'd look out the window, who is that? And, Mom said we were uh, hesitant to to go out and meet in a heck in a town of 750 people. You knew everybody, yeah. everything about them, but you still we, had, you still it had, took some time. You still had your guard up, didn't you? Yeah, we, uh, and that was, they were talking about the adjustment period you needed. Well, I didn't feel like I needed that, but I did. And I didn't know I was needing it, but it wasn't long until I was back in the flow. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't just go from combat, just going to, then just like going and walking in the park. You have to adjust to things. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, what a country boy I was when that was in December of 45 in the summer of 40. Yeah. In the summer of 46, uh, my buddy in Calhoun, J.C., Bubby Blancett, He'd, he'd been a fighter pilot in the war, and I was sitting out on the front steps there on Main Street, my home, and he drove by and stopped and got out. And he got to talk to me about the GI Bill, and I really didn't know about it. He said, Pay, it pays your way through college and gives you a little extra money. And he said, Let's go, let's go to college. I said, I'm in favor of that. Let's do it. And that's the rest of my story is still going on because that's when I fell in love. I came to Western, fell in love, and started school. Okay, so what what year did you start at Western? Fall. Of, well, I came to, first I started at the Bowling Green Business University. Do you remember that? No, sir, I don't. Well, it was uh, where those Twin Towers are down down College Street, okay. where I think it's older folks are maybe yeah, yeah, living yeah. in there. I, I know, I know. And that was <coughs> that was where college, Bowling College of Business was. It had a private school there, so I started there, and uh, I went two semesters to the Business University in fall of '46, spring of '47, fall of '47, spring of '48, and. Uh, I got into that accounting, and it cost accounting. I said, this is not me, I can't do this. So I laid out a semester and worked with the highway engineers over in Butler County building a bridge over Green River. And then I pitched baseball. I was a baseball pitcher, baseball player, and Mr. Diddle had coached at Western for okay. almost 40 years and was coaching baseball. And we played a game, I was pitching baseball for Morgantown, 
and we were playing against the Bowling Green team on Sunday afternoon, and we were playing on the Western Diamond, and I was the pitcher, and I had a very successful game. Mr. Diddle saw me pitching, and he came to me and said, you, in his lisping voice, he said, you ought to play for Western. And I thought, well, you know, BU didn't suit me, and I thought maybe coaching would. What I need to do is coach, so I, I, I started to Western, started playing baseball, and got me a degree, and went into education. And my first job out of, out of Western was uh, teaching and coaching at Park City, Kentucky, 25 miles up the road. Okay. And uh, I did that for two years. And I met this gal, Mama Joyce, that I've been married to for 65 years, was a next door neighbor of me and Calhoun. Calhoun High School sat here, and her house was on that side of the street. Mine was here. About a driver, good driver, down from my house to her house. And she was two years old when I graduated from high school. Yeah. I mean, no, she wasn't. She was in the first grade, okay. second grade, because she went out and uh, I went home from from my job at Park City because I would bought a car and I was playing for it by the month and I didn't, they didn't pay me up there but for nine months. So I had come home and got me a job over in Evansville where everybody in Calhoun worked and building refrigerators and okay. airplane wings and yeah, yeah. I got my job over there and I, saw this girl walk in the post office and I who in the heck is that? I went down there and that little neighbor girl, Mama Joyce, jo Joyce Bennett had grown up and we started to court. A year and a half later I married her and the people still say I robbed the cradle. How, how did you how did you introduce yourself to your wife? She I'm, knew me. She knew you? Yeah, she did, but she knew I was an old, an old war veteran. Yeah. She never knew that she had ever fit. You know, and that too much difference in the age. How, uh, did you just go up to her? She did, or she, did she I go went up? to her and I said, uh, you, you're uh, Joyce Bennett. You've grown up since I've been off the war in college. And uh, we got to talking and it fit. And she, she had had a, she's going to Murray State University. And she was dating the guy that was a catcher on the baseball team and a center on the baseball team. I can't think of his name right now. And they had been pretty serious. He's a great big old boy. And uh, somewhere I whooped him. <laughs> she, he came up to see her one time and uh, she broke a date with me. Oh, okay. When he came up, she didn't know he was coming. And, and I understood that. And, she got on me because I went down to Well Ice Cafe that night. She had a date with this guy, and uh, I had did some dancing with some other girls, and she got on me about it. And I thought, well, wait a minute. You, I had a date with you. You broke it, and now you're chewing me out yeah. for, for having. She thought I'd stay home yeah. and mope, I guess. Yeah. But we, we started dating, and, and it's worked. Yeah, I think it has. Yeah. I don't know many people are married for well, a Well, let me tell you something. And that made it uh, that made it easier because in that little old town, especially now, my mom and her dad went to the Methodist Church in Calhoun and they all knew each other and and uh, her mom and dad I think respected me. As a kid growing up, and I was a pretty good sort of a gay kid, and I think that made it all fit better. So when when did you retire? When did you at Western? No, from 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 uh, your job, or did you did you? Did you so when I graduated from from Western, I went to Park City okay. and was teacher and coach. Okay. I did that two years and then I ran into this woman, Mama Joyce, and uh, she was going to Murray, so she transferred to Westland in Owensboro, and I left Park City and went to coach and teach 
at Livermore, which was 10 miles from Calhoun, so we could be together. And that's how we come quit that. And so after we married, we, we stayed on there. I was the, was the coach, teacher, principal at Livermore High School. And uh, I was all for the assistant superintendent's job back in Barron County where I'd first gone when I got out to Park City. Okay. And the, and the old guy that ran a grocery store in Park City and I got to be good buddies and he thought I was a good guy and, and the superintendent said we need an assistant superintendent. And uh, Fred Perdue, the grocery man in Park City, was chairman of the board. He said, we'll get you one if you'll hire Lee Robertson. <laughs> I don't, it wasn't, wasn't that easy, I guess, but I got that job and stayed in it uh, for three years when Kelly Thompson, the president of Western, said, we need a guy here and uh, run our alumni program and uh, our placement service. And he asked me to take it. Well, I turned him down because I was superintendent of schools in in, in, in Barron County. I had been the assistant superintendent, and the superintendent left on a statewide educational job, and they put me in, and I was running my own school system, and yeah. it was a bigger job. You didn't than, want to step down, did you? No, and it's a bigger job than I had in Western, but we voted for a tax twice for transportation which and it voted down twice as bad the second time did the first and I called Kelly Thompson up and I said, Is that job still available here at Western? Yeah. He said, Yeah. So I went back and now I'm known as Mr. Western. Mr. Western. So when did you when did you retire from work from working? Uh, I haven't really. I'm still working half time at Western. Oh, really? Yeah, well, listen, what I did, I took that job, Alumni Affairs and Placement Services, both, and it wasn't long in there, eight or ten years, when I told the president, I said, they got to split these jobs. I, I can't handle both of them. It's too, both of them need a, a director. So I left the placement go, <coughs> and I took over the the alumni affairs job. I did that for 25 years. In 19, 1960, 1985, I retired and uh, I sat around the house. And I'd been working since I was seven years old. I hadn't been off. Ain't off. And, and Joyce, my wife, said, you're the most unhappy guy I've ever, I've ever known. And, uh, and we both sat down there and talked about it. I said, heck, I, I feel useless. And the, the guy that had been the catcher on the baseball team was, had him a lumber company in Bartow, Florida. He had started, he's a CEO president, and he asked me to come down there and work with him for in that business. At that time, he was selling circuit breakers, a Japanese company had bought in in Korea, and I went over the co whole country that year selling, try to market those circuit breakers. And uh, at the end of the year, that wasn't working out to suit me. And and the, Gary Ransdale, the president, of him. and I had he had been my assistant in the alumni affairs for okay. two or three years. And he called me and said, you ought to come back and help us out in development and public relations and all. And uh, that's where I left class school and came to Western. You're still working today a little bit. I'll right? tell you something. I, I retired from that alumni job in 1985. Okay. And, then, and then I just I just told you, I directed the Glasgow campus for six months. And okay. that, and then I coached our golf team for a year, for six years. And that's when Gary said, you need to help us out up here. When I didn't want to do that golf coaching anymore. And that's when I went to Western in 1985. And I'm still there. Yeah. I work, I, under my retirement system, with the teacher retirement system in Kentucky, okay. I can work. Hundred days a year. Okay, and that's what I'm doing. You're still working. You're nice. Yes. So, 
I, I just was. You know what? The reason I'm still working, they pay me. And I can use the money because I've been a teacher all my life. I'm, I'm not a rich man. I'm yeah. comfortable. But I can use the money. And the second thing is, I believe if I had not. If I had not gone back to work, I wouldn't be here. Just kind I, think of that, I think that's kept me going. Yeah, just you kind of keep busy, keep your mind sharp. Right. You got a real sharp mind. Yeah. Well, you know, when you called me, I was uh, I was really excited to talk to you, and I said because I haven't done one, did, did, uh, haven't done these interviews in a while, and I've been looking forward to talking to you, and it's been a really honor to talk to you, especially someone of your generation, and I just want to. Uh, Thank you for your service and, and the things you've done for your country. And uh, in closing, I'll let you have the floor. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about, or is it? Is it, how do you feel about that? We like uh, uh, when you walk in and see the flag. How do you feel about the flag or the military? Or is there anything you'd like to close with? I love the military. I love the flag, and I take my hat off and my hand over my heart and salute it. Yeah. I don't blame you. Uh, this is what, that's what this interview is about. Now, I, I appreciate your your uh, your service, and uh, uh, I'm in charge of all the flags, all the libraries, and, and every time I make sure they they look good, and, and I think about people like you when I when I raise it. When I raise the flag. The thing I have a hard time with now is the athletes kneeling and yeah. ducking their heads yeah. when the flag comes in and they sing the national anthem. I have a hard time accepting it. I know that we live in a free country and we have some freedoms and, and, they, and they have that freedom. But man, it's hard for me to understand. Here you are you're making your living, you're making a good living, and it's because of America that you're making it. And uh, we're honoring our banner, uh, and you can't appreciate that. I have a hard time with it. I accept it, but I have a hard time yeah, with I, it. I see where you're coming from. Uh, well, I just want to uh, shake your hand. I appreciate this interview, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it also, and I appreciate you asking me to do it. Yeah, it's been an honor. It has been for me. Thank you.